the humanity. Thanks, Samia. <laughs> As I was saying, it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to this brown bag presentation. I'm Jamie Goodrich, the director of the Humanities Center. And today, um, Stephen Winter, who is the Walter S. Gibbs Distinguished Professor of Constitutional Law here at Wayne State, is going to give us a, a talk um, entitled The Maid and the Made Up. And I've got a lengthy biography here, but I've been told not to go into too much depth. So I will just say that um, Professor Winter is a distinguished professor. He has a long and distinguished career, um, uh, as that title indicates. And he's also a wonderful friend of the center and a member of our advisory board. And I'm, I'm grateful to him and value his, his advice and his presence. And I've really been looking forward to this talk, which is entitled The Maid and the Made Up. And so I'll turn it over to him. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you for being short. Sure. You, you can... Look at the web page if you want to know more details, guys. It's not critical. Um, so this is an already published piece. I, I, I'm very old school. I'm going to read a paper. Um, I've edited it down, so I've taken out some stuff. Um, but I wanted to get the important parts. Um, it's going to run about 26 minutes, and um, then we'll be open for questions. Uh, I'm going to warn you that the, the beginning is kind of rough sledding. The last couple of sections are going to be a little easier to follow along. So. Um, yeah. Um, but, you, but feel free to ask questions about the, the easy stuff or the hard stuff. That's fine. Um, in her essay, Truth and Politics, Anna Arendt presents truth as in conflict with an inherently vulnerable to politics. It is, quote, always in danger of being maneuvered out of the world. Three factors combine to put truth at a disadvantage. First, the purveyor of falsehood has the upper hand. Quote, since the liar is free to fashion his facts to fit the profit and pleasure, or even the mere expectations of his audience, the chances are that he will be more persuasive than the truth teller. Indeed, he will usually have plausibility on his side. His exposition will sound more logical, as it were, since the element of unexpectedness, one of the outstanding characteristics of all events, uh, has mercifully disappeared. Second, truth is disadvantaged because, for Arendt, it is unpolitical by nature. Politics is a domain of opinion, debate, and persuasion. Truth, on her view, is tautologically compulsory as truth. Quote, factual truth, like all other truths, peremptorily claims to be acknowledged and preclude debate. Once submitted to the political realm, however, a truth claim becomes the subject of debate and the object of persuasion. This makes truth doubly vulnerable. On one hand, it is, quote, relatively easy to discredit with just another opinion. On the other hand, if truth should prevail, it would be undone by its own success. It would succeed not on its merits, but by dint of, quote, the agreement of the many who might change their minds tomorrow. It would become mere opinion. Third, the stakes change with the emergence of what she calls Madison Avenue methods and the mass manipulation of fact and opinion through image making, in which, quote, every known or established fact can be denied or neglected. The greatest danger is the, the destruction of, quote, the sense by which we take our bearings in the real world. It is disorientation rather than falsehood that becomes the object of the political lie. The result, quote, is a peculiar kind of cynicism, an absolute refusal to believe in the truth of anything, no matter how well this truth is established. Arendt traces three of the most familiar pathologies of lying in the political sphere, pathologies that seem even more characteristic of our day than of hers. But the analysis is on her own account problematic. Arendt recognizes that, quote, the modern age believes that truth is neither given to nor disclosed to, to, but produced by the human mind, and that, quote, facts always occur in a context. She nevertheless proceeds within the conventional opposition of fact and fiction. She repeatedly speaks of simple factual statements, brutally elemental data, and facts that assert themselves by being stubborn. Yet, if facts were really elemental, brutal, and stubborn, they should have greater force, whatever their other systematic disadvantages. For parenthetically, no, the earth is not flat. Now, yes, COVID is real and has killed nearly 7 million people, yet there are people who disbelieve each of these stubborn facts. If, on the other hand, facts are produced by the human mind, then the problem is acute. The historical contingency and social construction of knowledge would seem to put the very category of fact in question. Since most of what we know is not grounded in first-hand observation, the naysayer can always attack the issue, <clears throat> sorry, can always attack the basis for any claim of fact. And that seems to characterize the political sphere today, where the insight that truth is socially constructed has been cynically weaponized. 
Any unwelcome report is characterized as fake news, and fantastical claims are served up as alternative facts. The consequences are dire. Quote, fake news confuses us and makes us doubt whether any source can be trusted. Cynicism has morphed into full-on paranoia as rumors, misinformation, deliberate distortions, and falsehoods proliferate. Quote, everything that once seemed definitively and unquestionably real now seems slightly fake. Everything that once seemed slightly fake now has the power and the presence of the real. The last two quotes obviously are uh, about the internet and the social media, the digital world. In the digital age, the made is swiftly surpassed by the made up. It is conventional to think of truth as a relation between statements and states of affairs in the world. It seems to follow that if truth is understood as the product of social and historical processes, the dissolution of truth into post-truth, or anything goes, is inevitable. This is a false and mistaken logic. To humanize or historicize truth is to recognize that truth is inevitably a quality of discourse. As such, it is an intersubjective function, a matter of how we relate to one another through communication. There is a critical normative difference between the constructed, the made, and the made up. Truth is an ethical relation. Like democracy itself, it is rooted in an ethic of mutual recognition and respect. In that sense, we are never both true. The words fact and fiction are cognates, sharing a common etymology in the Latin facere, to make, and fictio, a fashioning. Both fact and fiction are constructed, shaped by expectations born of prior experience. Even perception, which seems to come unstructured to our senses, is formed in the brain in an interaction between incoming perceptual signals and previously acquired mappings that mutually adjust until the neural firings match. In Hilary Putnam's apt phrase, the mind and the world jointly make up the mind and the world. To ask, as Arendt does, about the fact stories or characterizations that people are likely to find convincing is to inquire into what will make the most sense to them under the circumstances. Reality is always a matter of a world viewed more precisely interacted with under some frame of reference. As Nelson Goodman argues, if I ask about the world, you can offer to tell me how it is under one or more frames of reference. But if I insist that you tell me how it is apart from all frames, what can you say? We are confined to ways of describing what is described. Our universe, so to speak, consists of these ways rather than of a world or worlds. Even, quote, the allegedly absolute objectivity and precision of the natural sciences, Arendt notes, quote, is today a thing of the past because the answers of science will always remain replies to questions asked by men. Truth is necessarily something framed by human processes. It is tempting to respond <clears throat> by pointing, like Dr. Johnson kicking the stone, to some simple irrefutable fact. Arendt mentions Grotius's insistence that, quote, even God cannot cause two times two to, to not make four. But a three-fingered God would say that two plus two is 11 in base three, where each place into the left represents a multiple of three. And a digital God would insist that what we call two by two plus two is 100 right, in base two. If two plus two equals four seems inescapable to us, is because, as Vico says, quote, mathematical matter we have we can prove because we ourselves have made them, quote, quote. Two plus two equals four is a formal mathematical proposition, not a statement about a mind-independent world. One might reply that two matchsticks added to two matchsticks will still be that many matchsticks, regardless of how it is represented by our mathematical convention. True enough. But the formal mathematical statement two plus two equals four is true only for some kinds of things in the world, like matchsticks and stones and the like, and not others. If we are adding two atoms of hydrogen to two atoms of oxygen, two plus two will be one, a single molecule of hydrogen peroxide. Alternatively, it can be two, one molecule of water and one free oxygen atom. Add, add two more oxygen atoms to the mix, so two plus two plus two, and you will still have only two, one water molecule and one molecule of ozone. And if we are adding two cubic feet of air to two cubic feet of air, the answer will have to be <clears throat> expressed either in cubic feet per minute, as in ventilation, or in pounds per square inch, if we are as, as in the case when we are adding add to a closed container like a tire. Normal functioning, Maurice Merleau-Ponty observes, quote, must be understood as a process of integration 
in which the text of the external world is not so much copied as composed. The world is for us a field of engagement that is necessarily shaped by our purposes, our categories, our experiences, and our conceptions. To recognize that all facts are constructed is neither to deny reality nor to suggest that anything goes. That, Merleau says, would be, quote, to pass from absolute, absolute objectivity to absolute subjectivity. But the second idea is no better than the first and is upheld only against it, which means by it, close quote. Arendt quotes Nietzsche in Twilight of the Idols, quote, we have abolished the true world. What has remained, the apparent one perhaps? Oh no. With the true world, we have also abolished the apparent one. Nietzsche, she explains, is not denying the true world, but rejecting the conceptual scheme, quote, the whole framework of references, close quote, that orients our thinking. The next step is not nihilism, but an overcoming of nihilism. Rent, as we shall see in a moment, does not take this next step. Truth is made in, of, and through a world that is both plastic to and recalcitrant to our actions. Consider global warming. Our greenhouse gases are changing the physical and social world. One could deny the phenomenon, but one cannot wish it away. It has been said that for our end, everything human is contingent, and that man is, in a phrase credited to Merleau-Ponty, the dwelling place of the contingent. <clears throat> it is unlikely, however, that Arendt and Merleau-Ponty would have understood this remark in the same way. For Arendt, contingency means just that things could always have been otherwise. What is internal for Arendt is solitary and subjective. The standpoint of truth, she says, quote, is one of the various modes of being alone, such as the solitude of the philosopher and the isolation of the scientist and the artist. Within that space, Arendt says, I make, quote, present to my mind the standpoint of those who are absent. When Merleau-Ponty says that man is the dwelling place of the contingent, he means that the contingent dwells in us. Quote, society for man is not an accident he suffers, but a dimension of his being. He is not in society as an object is in a box. Rather, he assumes it by what is innermost in him. The idea of a solitary thinker is, for Merleau-Ponty, just a theoretical construct. Because we are fashioned in our interactions with our physical and social world, we always already contain those experiences and relationships within us as sedimentations or imaginative abstractions of those interactions. We are, in a word, situated. Existing social practices and conditions are neither mere context nor representations in consciousness. Rather, they form both the grounds of intelligibility for and the horizons of our world. The past, as Frank Michaelman says, quote, is constitutively present in and for every self as language, culture, worldview, and political memory. Contingency for Merleau-Ponty thus has a double meaning. It still connotes the idea of a fundamental element of chance in history, but it also bears the additional sense of being dependent or, condi or conditional. Language, history, and culture make us who we are. Quote, since we are all hemmed in by history, it is up to us to understand that whatever truth we may have is to be gotten not in spite of but through our historical adherence. The contingent is foundational for us. This changes our conception of truth. Once I have recognized that it is only through history that knowledge, quote, can have a meaning for me, my contact with the social in the finitude of my situation is revealed to me as the point of origin of all truth, including scientific truth, close quote. Science is not only an answer to questions posed by humans, as Aaron says, it emerges from and is shaped by various social processes and products, scientific methods and mores, prevailing theoretical frameworks, and emerging technologies, the electron microscope, the particle accelerator, CRISPR design tools for genetic engineering, that these create, all create new pathways for inquiry. <clears throat> Science, for the most part, has the advantage of being able to prove itself in action. Rockets have to fly, after all. But truth historicized in this way is not always subject to direct confirmation. We can appeal only to the conventional criteria of comprehensiveness, fit with the evidence, elegance or parsimony, and pragmatic usefulness. Not surprisingly, the kind of criteria already invoked by science. There is no absolute standard by which truth can be adjudicated. We can imagine a God's eye point of view, but we cannot step outside our own head to attain it. This leaves much in doubt because more than one explanation of events is often possible. Scientific method, like any methodology, 
makes it easier to tackle a problem or organize data because it foregrounds those elements that are most relevant to the job at hand, relegating to the background the welter of other detail. But in simplifying a task to make it more manageable, one may also be falsifying it, that is, omitting factors that actually matter. This insight underlies Thomas Kuhn's observation that science progresses not by achieving better and better descriptions of reality, but rather by shifts in scientific paradigms that better solve the problems at hand. Because scientific formulations simplify in just this way, more than one method or theory may actually work, and in that sense be true in scare quotes now. Arendt makes much the same point with respect to Marxist theory of history, which she says mistook a pattern for meaning. Once, we re once one recognizes that theories are partial in the way that they highlight and interpret data, it follows that more than one pattern or historical theory may account for the past in equally satisfying or persuasive ways. Arendt, however, totalizes this insight. For her, there is, uh, this, the, the language here gets a little awkward, but I wanted to stay close to her own quotes here. There is, quote, almost no pattern into which the events of the past would not have fitted as neatly and consistently as they did Marx's own. In response to Heisenberg's insight that science is always the answer to a human question, Arendt raises the same nihilistic worry that if there is no question that can lead to a consistent set of answers, then, the, then quote, the very distinction between meaningful and meaningless questions would disappear together with absolute truth, close quote. If truth is made, then, quote, we can almost we can take almost any hypothesis and act upon it with a sequence of results in reality, which not only makes sense, but work. She emphasizes act and work. This nihilistic worry, what Richard Bernstein calls the Cartesian anxiety, is an artifact of Arendt's either or, all or nothing thinking. Quote, the frightening arbitrariness, she admits, is the exact counterpart of consistent logical processes, close quote. To understand contingency as the situated quality of human endeavor, is in contrast to change the table of possibilities. To be situated, that is to be mortal, is to face limits. If it were true that anything goes, our situation would not be a situation. It would be an, an irrelevance. Our situation shapes the questions we may pose and constrains the answer we can find. The situated thus comprises or sublates the necessary and the contingent. One may, for example, doubt the efficacy of vaccines, one can believe in the superiority of natural immunity or that vaccines cause all sorts of imagined harms, but the microscopic world is not pliant to these beliefs. The measles outbreak in 2019 before COVID hit us and the shocking reemergence of polio, paralytic polio in the United States in 2022 show that one cannot make just anything work. Our best guide to action remains the very human enterprise of science with its measures of statistical significance and confirmations through experimentation. Also overstated is Arendt's strong opposition between fact and fiction. Facts, she says, are beyond agreement and consent, quote unquote. But with all fallible, I'm sorry, but with only fallible human processes to establish them, facts stand in need of testing and debate. The paradigm dependence of scientific and historical data means that facts all come with points of view. That's a quote from the talking heads to the film. Mm -hmm. Facts are neither peremptory nor mere opinion. They require critical inquiry and rigorous discussion. We live in the space between fact and fiction. The question of truth rests with us. It is, as we shall see in a moment, a matter of what we owe to one another. So it gets a little easier after that. Um, if democracy were just a matter of aggregating preferences through voting, the question of truth would be less pressing. A voter who misrepresents her preferences might mislead others, but she would be undermining her own desired outcome. Candidates might misrepresent their true beliefs to get elected, but as long as they govern in a manner consistent with the preferences of the majority of their constituents, democracy would work smoothly enough. Of course, candidates may say one thing to get elected and act inconsistently once in power. If the system lacked transparency and accountability, misrepresentation would undermine self-governance. But if such behavior is public knowledge, voters could vote that representative out of office. Misinformation about other candidates would remain a real and inevitable problem. But on this bare bones view of democracy, the only critical problem, unfortunately no longer hypothetical, would be misrepresentations that undermine the integrity and legitimacy of the electoral system itself. The picture changes on a more meaningful view of democracy as self-governance. Lincoln's government of the people, by the people, for the people. 
Self-governing citizens need accurate information to respond to the problems they face and to decide how best to organize various aspects of social life. Yeah. False or misleading information will cause practical, psychological, and dignitary harms that undermine democracy. Suppose citizens experience a power grid failure during a winter storm that causes widespread suffering and more than 200 deaths. They are told by authorities that the power grid failure was caused by frozen wind turbines. In fact, it was the result of a failure to winterize the natural gas infrastructure. If citizens vote to replace or repair the wind turbines, their attempt at self-rule will have been frustrated. The next bout of extreme weather may cause the system to fail again, leading to more death and suffering. Citizen, citizens would, in addition, risk demoralization. <clears throat> they may come to feel that their well-being is beyond their control. The autonomy that is the very point of democratic self-rule, that is the people's capacity to exercise authority with respect to their fate, will have been nullified. Mistake is always a possibility. The power grid failure <clears throat> may have been caused by multiple factors. The citizens might make an informed decision that nevertheless failed because the good faith information they received was mistaken or incomplete. Demoralization would still be a possibility, but it would be a temporary consequence of human fallibility. A resilient polity would learn from its mistakes and try again. The practical harms would be the same, but in the absence of systematic misinformation, demoralization could be overcome. The psychological and dignitary concerns can be met by a subsequent successful exercise of self-governance. The picture is different when the problem is not mistake but misinformation. Misrepresentation by government officials, perhaps influenced by ideological or partisan considerations, abrogates government of the people by severing the link between the represented and their representatives. It compromises government by the people because it precludes the decision that people would have made had they been given accurate information. Beyond helplessness and frustration, citizens may also feel betrayed by or disillusioned with a government that does not respond to their concerns. The situation is worse still if the misinformation comes from a self-interested third party, such as the fossil fuel industry. In addition to the practical psychological and dignitary harms, democracy will have been hijacked for private gain. Government for the people will have been thwarted. In either case, accountability through the democratic process will depend entirely on the subsequent availability of better, more accurate information. A lie, in contrast, strikes at the heart of democracy in a different, more profound way. A lie is something more and sometimes less than a falsehood. Asked to define a lie, most English speakers say that a lie is a false statement. But when asked to identify a statement as a lie, factual falsity is the least important of the three criteria that people actually use. Linda Coleman and Paul Kay found that, quote, falsity of belief is the most important element in the prototype of lie, intended deception the next most important, and factual falsity the least. They found, moreover, that, quote, subject fairly easily and reliably assign the word lie to reported speech acts in a more or less rather than an all or nothing fashion, and that they agree fairly generally on the relative weights of the elements. The social understanding of why this <clears throat> reflects a series of assumptions captured by H.P. Grice's cooperative principle. The pragmatics of ordinary discourse presupposes that participants are engaged in the same purposive interaction. Grice identified four correlates he calls the maxims of quantity, quality, manner, and relation. Conversational speech should be as informative as necessary for the purpose, but not more so. One should not say something one believes is false or for which they lack adequate evidence. And one's contribution should be clear, brief, and to the point. The concept of why is understood relative to the default expectation that conversation typically involves an intention to be helpful that is by efficiently sharing necessary relevant information. Since under ordinary conditions, only truthful information is helpful, listeners assume their, their conversants have, according to the maximum of quality, sufficient evidence or reason to believe the accuracy of their own statements. A lie then is a statement the speaker does not believe to be true. Falsity of belief entails intent to deceive, that is a breach of the fundamental normative assumption of intention to be helpful. Factual falsity is the least important, but most interesting of the elements of lying. On one hand, factual, factually false statements will be assessed differently depending on social context. They may be jokes, fiction, tall tales, social lies, white lies, exaggerations, or fantasies. 
In the first three cases, speaker and listener are operating within a frame that assumes other purposes for the communication, humor or entertainment, for example. Similarly, the term social lie assumes a frame of communication in which politeness is more helpful than information. White lie assumes a frame in which the informational condition is generally applicable, but where the information has little importance. Exaggeration and fantasy assume that although the conversational norm of helpfulness is relevant, the informational condition is not. The speaker's belief may be diluted or overblown, but the listener is not relying on it for relevant or accurate information. On the other hand, factual falsity is not necessary to the intersubjective quality of a lie. Suppose that in casual conversation, I insist to you that two plus two equals four is a universal truth applicable everywhere and always. You know from what I said before that I don't believe this. Without some qualifier marking an alternative frame of reference, such as assume arguendo, you would be suspicious of my motives and worry whether I was trying to manipulate or deceive you in some way. Indeed, you would do so even if you believe that two plus two equals four is a universal. The relation between truth and trust is both reciprocal and constitutive. Truthful communication and shared information build trust between interlocutors, a lie undermines it. Conversely, because most of what we know is a matter of having adequate reasons for belief rather than firsthand knowledge, trust is necessary to truth. We depend on our interlocutors to share with us only what they believe true. What distinguishes a lie from misinformation then is that a lie expresses disrespect toward or disregard for its audience. Democracy, however, requires mutual re regard and respect. Let me conclude by briefly explaining why. There are many possible modes of social ordering that are more or less effective. We judge them not merely on how well they provide various social goods, but also on the degree to which they realize ethical values, such as justice and respect for human dignity. If democracy were just about aggregating the preferences of autonomous individuals, the, regard, the lack of regard for one another might not matter any more than it matters in anonymous markets. But as Arendt says, freedom is possible only among equals, close quote. This is true for two reasons, one positive, the other negative. The positive reason is that without a commitment to equal dignity and respect, freedom is impossible. In the social world of complex problems and competing interests, what Arendt calls the condition of plurality, complete individual autonomy is not feasible. We necessarily engage with others in an ongoing scheme of social life. If freedom is understood in positive terms as exercising control over one's fate, then it requires political association and collective action. Only a collectivity, quote, mutually bound by promises and an agreed purpose have, as Arendt says, quote, the capacity to dispose of the future as though it were the present. Conversely, without a commitment to equal dignity and respect, freedom understood as self-governance is impossible. Those with the ability to do so have every reason to engage in strategic, in strategic action to implement their strongly held preferences. In doing so, they would necessarily compromise the self-governance of their fellow citizens. The result would be a form of oligarchy in which some citizens are dominated by others. In other words, democratic collective action would hardly be self-government, unless everyone had an equal say. Democracy then is a mode of coordination between self-governing citizens who share authority over social life and in conditions of mutual recognition and respect. Democracy like truth is an ethical relation. A political lie undermines democratic self-government in the same way that lying under, undermines communication. In the place of cooperation and respect, it substitutes manipulation and disregard for one's fellow citizens. Today's politics is increasingly a no holds barred us versus them struggle. Truth is the first casualty, but not the ultimate one. Deliberate misinformation is a strategic weapon used to dominate others by disorienting or gaslighting them with a blizzard of half truths, distortions, and outright fabrication. Social fragmentation and consequent political polarization have destroyed the common ground and sense of common interests that, as John Dewey says, constitute a public as such. When the opposing sides demonize each other, neither communication nor collective governance is possible. One cannot, as Arendt says, quote, speak in such a way that the truth of one's own opinion reveals itself to oneself and to others, close quote, when no one cares and no one is listening. The problem is, that, is not that we have lost sight of truth, 
but that we have lost sight of each other. Questions for the speaker. I'm going to give you two point seven six seconds. Okay. With questions for our speaker, yeah, go ahead, Brian. Hi, thanks. Um, I have a I have a little question about an example, and then a big question just to make sure I'm getting take one at a time. Getting the, the few right. Uh, I'll start with the big question. I just want to know right. if this is a fair paraphrase of the of the view on offer. So the it seemed like the first half of the paper was saying we could be something like um, communitarian relativists or some sort of epistemic relativists or maybe some more radical kind of historicists or maybe pragmatists about truth or whatever. Somewhere in, in that mix, In the yeah, vein of Arendt. Uh, but nevertheless, um, preserve a distinction between fact and fiction, truth and falsehood, the sincere assertion and lying and so on. Um, and therefore, um, those epistemic commitments I just mentioned are you claim in the second half of the paper um, compatible with a political demand that the state be truthful or something like that? Well, not the, my focus is not the state. Or that a demo compatible with an insistence that in democratic society for um, self government to go well, we need access to accurate yeah, statements so of fact or something that's like that. Not quite my argument. Okay. Right? Well, the premise is correct. Right. So my, my the epistemic your description of my epistemic assumptions is essentially correct, um, but it's not. It was, uh, but still, right. And then there was a series of distinctions. You know, hold on to a series of epistemic distinctions between fact and fiction. Um, I don't think you said truth and falsity, but you know, you said fact and fiction. Yeah, and it was an intermediate one. I forgot what it was. Oh, I said I just read it. No, 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 truth, I, falsity, I, lying versus sincere assertion. Yeah. Uh, so I think of those, the only. Distinction I'm holding on to is lying versus sincere. Okay. Okay. Um, in fact, the the, the 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 theoretical thrust of the paper is to deconstruct the distinction between fact and fiction, truth and falsity. Um, right, but still hold on to the difference between the made, which is both fact and fiction, and the made up, right, which is in this realm beyond. So the the last one, right, sincere and lying, that distinction is the only one I'm actually holding on to. Um, the, um, so, so for a more traditional epistemic point of view, uh, the tr tr typical reaction is, oh, you're just a ra radical relativist, and that's the nicest thing that they would say, right? Uh, and that just boils down to crude subjectivism. And then my response is, oh, you kind of missed the whole point, um, right? Because uh, Merleau-Ponty's point, and it's a very Hegelian point, and he's the one who introduced Hegel into French philosophy. In fact, um, is this kind of uh, oppositional thinking is the problem. That if you believe in subjectivity, it's only because you already committed yourself to objectivity. It's only in comparison to the objective that you don't have that everything looks subjective. But the world's just way more complicated than that. There's just a huge space in between. Um, indeed, the situated, uh, in his view, works in Hegelian terms and, uh, and, 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 of, and of God right, and overcoming. Uh, uh, thesis, uh, antithesis, synthesis, and step beyond. So, um, so, so no to all of those, right? I mean, the paper actually starts, and this is ironic because this is the Manny Center, um, with a discussion of Mark Twain, Lord Byron, and Herman Melville. Um, but I had to leave it out because I've never gotten through the, the, the core of the paper. Um, that distills sincerity rather than fact versus fiction. Um, as the, the, the key point. So, um, yes, you've got my epistemic premises, but um, the shift is once we see that both facts and fiction are equally humanly constructed. I mean, the point about fiction is that fiction is not made up. It is made up, but it's not made up because if it were truly made up, it would be incomprehensible, right? So what fiction is, is a fashioning of stuff that we already know and think into a new way of knowing and thinking, right? That's the, uh, so in that sense, it only hits if it isn't entirely made up, right? That's the, um, and um, yeah, and, and fact, and the point was that fact is sort of equally a construction, right? Because facts are relative to frames of reference. I don't want to use points of view because that sounds a little too subjectivist, but uh, frames of reference with background sets of understanding and assumptions, 
all those things that make us who we are, right? There. So it's a strong history, historicist point of view. Um, there is a strong, you might correctly identify a very strong pragmatist, right? Uh, the truth is cashed out in, 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 in real world endeavors. Um, and and um, yeah, so, so you got that part right, but where I want to go with that is to say, the only way to get out of this field, this, this opposition between fact and fiction, truth and falsity, is to sort of push it up to another level um, and focus instead on the intersubjective, on the quality of intersubjective discourse um, and, analyze, and analyze it from that perspective. Well, that's that's the answer to the big question. I hope that makes the, I know the paper was rough flooding, but that's the, um, especially for the students, but that's the, um, that, that, that's the basic move that's being made here. And, and then there's a, the last section basically takes the pragmatics and ethics of discourse and lays it side by side by the, with democracy and argues that they're both doing the same thing. And that the key is not what the state says to us or what the fossil fuel industry says. But what's breaking down is that is that democracy um, is a relation of equality between self-governing subjects who treat each other with mutual recognition and respect. And that's what we've lost out there. But we've obviously lost, we all know that we've lost that. Um, but it's a it's a it's a different and deeper definition of democracy, that's, which I worked out in other previous papers, which of course are all cited in the footnotes. I gave a, essentially a summary of what the argument looks like in that last section. So I hope that helps on the big question. That doesn't, you may not be persuaded, but that's at least that, that's the point of view I want to go for. Yeah, it helps with uh, my question about how to understand mm -hmm. the argument. Is that a, a small question? Why don't I just let's let it come around and then, yeah, okay. I'd like to put some pressure on the argument now. That no, I, sure. That well, but, but I'll just wait. Till okay. Later. Other questions? Yeah, Barrett. So um, this is a question coming from an area of concern about the nature of belief and false belief. Uh, what happens when beliefs radically change in a situation like religious conversion and where the world seems to be one thing and then there's a entire reversal of all truth claims to a completely different but still con consistent mm -hmm. set of relationships? So Augustin uh, Augustinian conversion is one version of that. But I'm also thinking about 1933 with the switch over, uh, you know, from the Weimar period to fascism, and suddenly a whole series of beliefs got reversed and turned on their head. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering where that where that possibility would fit in terms of the kind of phenomena that we're observing now, which is the unfoundedness of beliefs that have sometimes a kind of conversion mentality associated with them. And I'm also wondering whether whether Arendt's uh, notion of nihilism is helpful here, and whether maybe she's in some way channeling that 1933 experience when she starts thinking or tries to worry about the. Yeah, I assume she must have been right. I assume she must, but it's also to Nietzsche. So yeah. one of the questions is where 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 you know how to how to think about that, and it seems that you know you're you're proposing that for her. There was a, a specific relationship between nihilism and universal claims. If they're completely universal, then they could be completely irrelevant because they're all believed by everybody. So they, in a way, the flip comes at a very vulnerable point in universalism, right? There, and, and you could also say that nihilism produces the demand for some reestablishment of the universal claim. And that's what happens in 1945, where you yeah. get total discussion. Well, I think their historical description, I have no quarrel. Yeah. I, I'm not sure I, I agree with your characterization of art, but okay. We'll go. We'll go. I, I'd like to hear more about where the the nihilist moment fits, not just in art, but in in the in the mini conversion experiences we have about people believe suddenly believing systemically false things where they didn't believe them before. I'm I, I'm I, I'm un, I'm going to struggle because I'm a little bit unclear about why that's important. Um, I mean, I recognize the phenomenon. In, in fact, I went through a conversion experience myself, but in the opposite direction. I was raised extremely religious uh, in a fairly insular uh, environment, um, and then had a conversion. I'm a complete atheist. That's uh, 
but you yeah. converted to that. Yeah, yeah, converted to that, right? Yeah. That's, uh, not that I think atheism is a religion. Yeah. I think that's a hopeless mischaracterization, but just yeah. to say, yeah. I have had that sense of living in one world and then, yeah. Yeah. right? So the reverse of uh, Augustine and the reverse of Saul. Well, well, let, right? let me go to uh, democracy then as a, as a scene for this. So when Trump gave his speech, where he made a racist comment about Mexicans. Right. That was the beginning of his campaign, and it flipped the discourse because prior to that moment, that would have been inadmissible. Correct. And the inadmissibility suddenly stretched the, the sense of what a normative statement could be could be in politics. Because it did that, it actually changed the whole basis for what counted as a normative uh, a, a normative statement. Right. So there's a there's a kind of a little conversion going on right there. Trump gets elected. One of the worries is that a whole range of things that are equally poorly founded could, by the same logic, actually become the new normal. They could be accepted as a whole set of relationships that are yeah, true for everybody. And that was why defeating Trump meant unlinking every one of these false claims, not taking them as if one they were part of one giant movement towards conversion, but actually try to isolate them and separate them out. And I guess that's where democracy would come back in. It was able to do that. Yeah, again, I... No quarrel with no your okay. description. So um, I think it's consistent with what I'm saying here. It's not what I'm focused on particularly, but uh, yeah, yeah. I think it's, um, part of what I'm saying here is, so, so let, let me reframe that. I, I want to say two things. Uh, first, I want to reframe this a little bit and say one reason for writing this paper um, is that when we talk about the problem of fake news, what dominates our discussion of it is either um, we got to get back to some hard truth, and God, there must be those those crazy postmoderns and deconstructions who caused all this trouble. Which was yeah. a ridiculous statement, right? That tobacco company was doing this. The tobacco company was doing this in the fifties, long before Derrida published his first article, right? It's got nothing to do with um, the. Um, or we say it's a peculiarity of the digital age. It's caused by social media, right? Um, not that social media isn't a contributor, but it certainly is. Right, but um, I think that neither of those ways of framing the problem are ultimately helpful. Um, and even though I think the social media part is partly true, um, I don't think it's a principal cause. Um, so I want to sort of refocus how we think about the issue of, of truth and false news um, and put it in the intersubjective plane in, in how we uh, speak to and more importantly, how we treat one another. I think that's the, that, that's the real pathology here that's driving all this. Um, now, Trump's role in that, I, I, I think you're completely right about. Um, so I would say this, if, um, so there's a footnote to a paper um, written by a, a, an acquaintance of mine, um, which he posted on SSRN, which purports to be an Arendtian account of the fake news thing, but it's really not. It's really a, a Con, uh, Kahneman and Swirsky kind of uh, uh, cognitive errors account. Look, why do people, so many people believe so many ridiculous things? What are the, uh, the cognitive errors, you know, the, um, all, the, all the cognitive fallacies that people supposedly carry around their heads? So I don't think that's, I, I don't know that that's wrong. I don't know that it's really helpful. I would give the following account. Um, in my experience, um, the two things that structure what people will accept as true, what they believe, is what the people around them are saying to them, what their social group reinforces, and that the social group reinforces anything that easily can become true. And I think that accounts for Weimar Germany, it accounts for lots of things like that. We're basically deeply social creatures, um, and our worldview is shaped in intersubjective interactions. So what we get positive feedback for in our in, in our whatever our social circles are, whether it's family or list, you know, the listserv or your 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 Twitter feed or uh, whatever, however it might be actualized. Um, those are the things that we believe. And then the second part, which is consistent with what you said, um, as long as it sort of fits some kind of total story, right? It has some kind of coherence to it. Um, so we can sort of fit the pieces into that story, right? So when both those things are happening, then we can believe wildly crazy things, right? That's the, I like the COVID one, right? Because um, a couple of summers ago, we were during the height of the pandemic, we rented a house up in, um, in Leland Al, which is something we do with some frequency. And then all the kids and their spouses come, and my son and sister and his, his wife and, and daughter-in-law they uh, show up and they've been to a wedding and and uh, 
my daughter-in-law Eve had had COVID, so we had to lock them up in their room in the, in the house. And fortunately, nobody else got sick. My son, who was exposed, never got didn't get sick. But um, so those of us who were healthy went to sleeping bear dunes, right? And we're walking around, and obviously with lots of other people. And this guy comes back to his family. He said he went to the ranger station, the, you know, the office, which was closed. He said because of the phony Roni, right? Right? It's like, and I'm thinking, you know, I got a sick family <laughs> just a few miles up the road here, right? But he really believes in the phony Rooney, right? That's the, and, and the vaccine, that's just, that's just the, within that social milieu, right? That, that's just referred to as the jab, right? You lack the jab, what's wrong with you, right? So that, that there's a whole coherent worldview and story. It's got nothing to do with reality, except it has everything to do with his reality. Which is the people he's talking to and the feedback that they get. So, um, yeah, I think that's you know, the, the point of the paper is that we're always in really serious danger, right? That's the, the, the people who think that they have a hold on on truth with a capital T um, are driven by a certain kind of fear, as with Bernstein called the Cartesian anxiety, um, and um, but it's a false hope. It's a false god. Um, you know, the truth is easily dethroned because um, we frequently have those um, either conversion experiences or whatever the opposite of the conversion experience, like going from a liberal democracy to Nazi fascism in what looks like the blink of an eye. Of course, it's not really a blink of an eye. Either. So, um, so yeah, and that's sort of what we've been experiencing over the last, right? I mean, what, what, what Trump did was not create, obviously, racism and misogyny and, um, uh, an anti-immigrant uh, hatred. What he did was make it respectable again right, for a large group of people who were feeling that way anyway, but were afraid to say so. Right? Trump made it respectable, and you know where, where for me you still really saw that. And you remember early in the Trump administration, the guy who got up with the trucker cap and the beard and and the plaid shirt in the middle of the aisle of an airplane and started ranting about we, we we're in control now. We're finally you know, Trump is president. We're in control. And he's yelling at everybody in the airplane. They had to like obviously take him off in handcuffs, right? But that's what people, that's what that group of, right, which is about 30% of our fellow citizens um, really felt, right? That what they had been believing all along had been suppressed, now erupted. And if you think about the whole uh, moral panic about critical race theory, right? Um, that's just about this, right? Is that we felt this way all along and you bastards made us feel guilty about it. And so we're going to, now that we're, we're in control, they think we're in control, right? We're going to take all those books, right? Um, like Tony Morrison's beloved, out of the curriculum. Why? Because they make us feel bad, right? And nobody should be able to feel, should feel this how they articulate guilt or shame about something that their ancestors did, right? And my response is if you read Tony Morrison's beloved, you should feel bad. That's the point of the book, right? You should be horrified. That's what you're going for, right? And it should transform you. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I, yeah, descriptively, I think we're completely in agreement in terms of our understanding of the historical shift. So I'm, I don't want to presume that we're epistemically in agreement, but, but we might. Be. <laughs> yeah, Brian. Yeah, go ahead, Brian. Okay, keep it keep it rolling. Um, okay, so now that I've got a, I think I have a better sense of the account on offer. Um, and I, so I just want to offer a, 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 some of that went by quickly. So maybe you already sort of addressed this. The paper is already published. You can find it on the web. Okay. It's published in philosophy um, and social criticism. Yeah. Uh, it's a sage publication. So you need to have access to it. But I think you can probably get it through yeah. the Wayne system. Then. So, so here's a view that's uh, uncontroversial and easy to make sense of. Uh, our um, uh, social practices for figuring out what the truth is or what facts of the matter are or our investigatory scientific practices or our practices of coming to consensus about this or that matter of factual or normative importance etc those are uh are socially embedded um they are historically contingent etc cetera, etc cetera. those are subject to being hijacked by pathological political circumstances and so on every i think everyone would agree with that Here's a more radical claim. Uh, truth itself, okay, or like uh, is, is subject to being so hijacked or there is no realm of mind independent facts about which interpretations are interpretations 
uh, and so on. And I'm wondering why for the- Because those last two statements contradict each other as far as I'm concerned, but finish your, your question. Because uh, the whole well, concept we, that there's something called truth in itself. If there is no mind independent, then there's no such thing as truth in itself. Yeah, I know, of course. No, I'm saying <laughs> they don't contradict each other. Those are the same statements. So there's no realm of mind independent facts. There's nothing about which we could be we can't, we can't wrong in some ultimate sense. Well, we can yeah. be wrong. We can't be wrong. We could think that vaccines don't stop diseases. They do. Okay. Well, let's come back to whether you... I'm, I'm a lot older than you. you. You don't know how traumatic it is, the idea that polio is reappearing. If you're a kid who grew up in the 50s like me, that was like a number one fear. I remember as a little kid, like four or five, and you see the videos the little kids like yourself in the iron lung and they can't move and they can't breathe and mom and dad are freaked out that you might get polio and end up like one of those kids that was a real real serious thing yeah and then sock comes along with the vaccine although he's ripped off this graduate student by the way that's been documented um, he didn't actually discover it uh, this is he literally had a graduate student living in his basement who was doing the work and ripped him off um, and then the soft vaccine comes out, and it's like the whole world changes. Like it went from, for me, the gray 50s to the sunny 60s. It was unbelievable. And the idea that that there's a group of people, I should say my people, right? Because it's the, the guy with the parallel polio in New York State is a extremely orthodox Jew um, who didn't get back vaccinated for this stuff. And now he's a 25 year old man, 26 year old man who's paralyzed for life. This just completely blows them right for boomers. That's yeah, I don't hear anything to disagree with. Yeah, no, I just say, a virus. Think of, there are real things. I just don't think there's truth itself. Okay, so yeah, so how do you how do you maintain a commitment to the realness of the real without uh, without believing in truth? In other words, how would you give an account of what's real, a philosophical account of what's real, without making a central reference to notions like facticity and truth? <clears throat> What makes it real when it's real? So, so I'm not sure I can answer how to answer that question. I'm not sure I can answer that question because you're asking me to respond within a frame that I don't think is a useful frame. So well, I think I, I'm I think given I, I a, want to a, a philosophical account, but it's one that only works for. Tell me how to believe in reality without believing in truth. Okay. Um, So the usually usual pragmatist response is to distinguish between truth with a capital T and truths in the plural with a small t, right? The truth with a small t can it, it, it map onto sort of realities, but the realities are all interpreted, which is why there's there's no truth with a capital T. So the philosophical account is not, I think, the philosophical account you're asking for. You're asking for an epistemic account that that accounts that explains what truth with a capital T is. And I'm saying, you know, we can imagine the gods, you know, I, I said to Bruce, right? It's like, if you're asking me, is there an Archimedean point? There is not. Can I imagine an Archimedean point? Yeah, I just don't know how to find it. So I suppose that, that there's this reality. Your reality is like the COVID reality. My reality is the no COVID reality, the fake Rona or whatever that is. I've heard like that. It's a good uh, tell me why yours is the better reality. Because 7 million people are dead. They're really dead, like they're truly truthfully they're dead. They're truly dead. So yeah. it's a truth. really, really, we are really, really mortal. Right. I just okay. literally so just true. watched my father die. I can right. assure you, mortality is a real thing. Yeah, I want to agree with you, but I don't know how. I to don't even think I have to call that truth with a capital T. Okay. It's something we all know, we all experience. And of course, we all, the extent that we don't believe in mortality is because we all live in denial, because believe, really understanding mortality, believing mortality is almost impossibly painful, right? I mean, that that's one of the bases of Heidegger's whole philosophy, that everything we do is about denial of death. That's, uh, but, you know, if that's real, yeah, I've seen it. It's pretty striking. I mean, I don't, you know, do I need, an, do I need a platonic account of truth outside the cave? I don't think I do. I, the, the force of the question was it seemed really important for you to deny a certain conception of truth. And I was wondering what the, much that I deny. I just don't think it makes sense. Well, that's what denial means. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. And so I was wondering uh, why you felt pressured to speak that way about truth while helping yourself to this very robust notion of reality. That yeah. sounds like it's just translatable with my truth talk. Like there's. I think at the end, it's really not. 
because how we understand reality in fact changed both within our own lifetimes and um, in, in the historical time. So, um, you know, the, you know, Kuhn famously talks about science as like a conversion experience, right? And it's the, you know, we used to think that the earth was the center of the universe and the sun and everything else uh, revolved around the earth. Um, and then at some point, you know, a couple of guys, Copernicus, Galileo come along and they say, you know what, you guys got it all backwards, right? Um, and and once they say that, and we see the world that way, we can't go back to thinking the old way, right? Like now we think, yeah, the, the, the sun is the center of the solar system and we revolve around that. And that's just true. Um, the, the striking thing, right? And this is the famous Kuhnian example. The striking thing is that um, Ptolemaic astronomy, right, which was based on the principle that the, that the Earth was the center of the universe, was remarkably effective and accurate at predicting all sorts of astronomical phenomena, including comets that only showed up once in a while, right? The theory was incredibly convoluted and had, you know, Phillips upon Phillips. Um, but it was actually predictive. Um, so it's really sort of, it's really kind of striking. It's one of the so I I this is not one fact, but that's uh, um, I'm not sure he has a second example, but it's quite a strong yeah, example. Some of the stuff at the atomic physics, nuclear physics level, probably is the next best example, but very few of us non-scientists really understand that in this kind of way. Just kind of nod along and we're impressed, but that's uh, uh, Kind of jump in here sure. because we've got a comment from Bruce. Um, of course, we do. And then Jose Cuello has his hand raised. So I'm going to read Bruce's comment out of the chat. He says, I want to make a comment, but my raised hand keeps disappearing. Here's my comment Steve and I want a third option between pure objectivity or truth and pure subjectivity or opinion. His alternative is respectful intersubjectivity, mine is rationality. Rationality concerns the responsible pursuit of truth that can be achieved even in the matrix, capital M. <laughs> a responsibility requires fitting your beliefs to the evidence. That's why in the political moral realm, it's a good means to the get to gathering and fitting your beliefs to the evidence. Yeah. But truth is not determined by that means. Truth does not change with the evidence, but responsible belief does, and hence so does rational belief. So I don't know if you want to respond to that. No, I mean, I guess this is a product of very long conversation, you know, Conversation with Bruce over the weekend, um, and we're he, he he's massaged it, and I've massaged it in the course of that, uh, where we're actually closer to each other, and that's reflected in his comment. So there's still points of differentiation, but he his comment particularly emphasizes the the way in which we're both looking for a third term between objectivity and subjectivity, um, and, and it's and it's tell Bruce it's well stated. Uh, let's go to Jose then, because I know he's got to go soon. So, can I make just a comment in between because it relates to the last question? It, what I object to is this relativization of truth, which was really the, part of the point of the last question, as I understood it. And so, this avoids that. It says mathematics is true, uh, whether homosexuality is wrong or right was always it was always true that it was permissible and so forth. But it accommodates actually recognizing truth and not mistakenly, I think, saying that truth then is a function of what I call uh, respectful inner subjectivity. It doesn't make it true that people respectfully uh, exchange views and come to that. view. I never that's, say that. that's, that's not a that's, that's what your uh, other inter questioner was making in his first question and his last one. I see no motivation for abandoning the notion that truth is the way things are, and evidence is we agreed on what, what we're, <laughs> we're responsible in believing the way the truth is. That that reconciles everybody's views and doesn't relativize truth to some sort of agreement between people or among just one person. I, I don't, I don't get the motivation for totally abandoning true. this perfectly it's reasonable that view. That doesn't okay, I'm done. My view. Bruce, except that that doesn't matter. Oh. I'm going to jump in here because I know Jose's been waiting a long yeah, time and has to go. So, Jose, please go ahead. Yeah, um, Dr. Wilson, you picked the most difficult subject in the world to talk about. It reminds me of, uh, can you hear me? Yes, fine. Yep. Uh, it reminds me of an old saying, trying to nail uh, jelly to a barn door. And... Uh, uh, one thing I would challenge is one of the premises of your talk is that somehow we have democracy in this country. 
I would say democracy is probably democracy and its promise of freedom and prosperity is probably the biggest lie in the world. And so I didn't say we had democracy. I don't think well, we are. Uh, but that was a position that if that if somehow we have truth, uh, we're going to have democracy. But um, anyway, I got to go drive a patient, uh, a friend to a doctor's appointment. Okay. And, uh, but I just wanted to make that comment. I like the nailing jelly to the wall. I think that's happening. <laughs> um, Thank you. I, I didn't say we were a democracy. I said we, right? I was speaking against, or I'm speaking against the backdrop of democratic commitments. But I think that we are basically an <laughs> oligarchy in a lot of ways. Absolutely. Thank you. The, um, so you know what 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 get, what bothers Bruce is is my reaction to truth itself. Um, but I don't know where you're going to go for an Archimedean point of view. We, I, we can, you know, my little Ponte said this. I didn't. This is uh, your view, Steve, is a subject of mine. It says the reason it's so important to have this respectful uh, inter interchange is because it's a way to gather evidence and to fit your beliefs to the evidence. It's a means to be responsibly pursuing the truth. And you can responsibly pursue the truth in the matrix because you fit your beliefs to the perceptual evidence. It's not actually attaining truth that rationality requires. It's fitting your beliefs to the evidence. Your view is a subset of mine. Why not, okay. Steve? I, I don't think the it truth, is. Truth, truth out there, it doesn't change. Because doesn't everybody think truth doesn't change? It didn't change when people thought that the sun went around the earth. Uh, that's It didn't change that that was false. What changed was the evidence. And so our rational beliefs should have changed in order to fit the beliefs of the evidence. Yeah, so it's the, so while well, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on fitting comprehensiveness and fitting the evidence and doing so with elegance and parsimony, um, it's the status of the word evidence that I think we really disagree on. That there's theory free evidence. I think, you, as I understand it, implicit in your position, and that's not a corollary that I hold. I think we agree on the evidence. I agree that evidence is gathered best, and uh, it's more likely to be your beliefs will be fit to the evidence if on certain subject matters, like political and political. Uh, matters and moral matters that you have respectful interchanges. Yeah, no, the kind we agree of, on that point. Clearly, well, we we agree agree. That point. that's why I say your view is a subset of mine, and, uh, it, and it doesn't to, make to this. <laughs> Steve, it's ridiculous to think that mathematical truth actually changes. It it can it it is absolutely necessarily true that two plus two equals four. What you point out is simply that that mathematical truth doesn't apply in every area of the physical world. So if you right. add two quarts of carbon tetrachloride to two you know, quarts of water, another version you're of not going to get example, four. It, it doesn't disprove anything. So It uh, just shows two. that you're wrong. It's an absolute you. universal truth that two to plus you. two is four. Who, who denies you. that? It's not for certain kinds of things. And mathematical um, formula will change to reflect that because the mathematics not itself recognizes it that changes, like that. Writing something in the base two does is another way of writing two plus two is four. One plus one equals no, that, one. That, zero. I agree, that I agree with, as I said, Bruce. You're, you're, you're just making the same points over and again more strenuously. You're not really uh, not we're not really engaging. So there's a I'm lot of trying. overlap between us. We believe in comprehensiveness I'm and rationality. We believe in intersubjective of, of rationality, ration, and we believe in rational belief. Those are strong points of congruence. Um, but you believe there's something truth in itself, and I think you believe in theory-free evidence, although maybe you don't. Um, but I don't think there is uh, theory. Still again, Steve. Sorry, I don't. You don't think I believe in what? Say that I, I missed that. I, I think you believe in theory-free evidence. But I don't want to impose a belief on you that you don't hold. But I don't believe in theory for evidence. Oh, I see. So we know from the cognitive sciences, and this is I was a quick reference in the paper. Uh, even what we perceive is actually not objective. That it's formed in the interaction between the incoming neural signals from our senses, sight, and sound, 
um, and the mappings that our brains have already formed, and that literally the perceptual signals change as they're coming into the brain. You can't, I don't know if you can see my hands, right? As the neurons are firing, they're trying to seek a map, and when they seek any, when they hit that equilibrium, that's when we have the perception, but the equilibrium is a, is a construct, it's constructed out of incoming signals and signals that are coming from inside the brain that are, um, re, that are, um, what's the way I want to put it, reanimations of previous mappings of previous firing. So literally perception is constructed in the brain. It's not a one-to-one -one correspondence with the world. It's not, a, it's now, not. We know that from science, right? So it's like, you know, there's actually evidence for it. it, it, it is that true? Steve, I agree with everything you say. Let me Did finish, you Bruce. What I said Bruce, the let me finish, Bruce. That's disrespectful. You don't want to have a conversation. I, I grant a lot of my, you say, Let me finish my thought. Very relevant. Bruce, let me finish my thought. So we know that from science, we have evidence for this. Will that yeah. still be the state of our understanding a hundred years from now? Is it truth yeah. in itself? I would not warrant that. I think it will be, but I can't warrant that, right? Because knowledge changes, our tools change, our ability to understand what's going on in the brain changes. So that, that's the difference. I have a strong notion of historical contingency. Um, but I, I think the real world is really there. There really is a real world that we're interacting with. We evolved to interact with the real world. That's why perception seems to us to be so straightforward. That's right. If we didn't, if we had evolved not to be able to process signals effectively from the real world, then the species would have, by evolution, would have killed us off. Wait, right? now do I get to respond to Steve? Yeah. I want to respond. This is a good in there, because, Bruce, because I think well, you, let the other people you, know. You, you, and, um, you and Steve could use at least another weekend and maybe not a month to work out your differences. <laughs> but I think we're past our time here. And so I, I want to thank our presenter and the audience. Thanks for a wonderful time, Steve. And thanks for everyone for the engaged conversation. Really enjoyable. We'll see you at the next round, Ed. You should let it go, Jamie. You should let the session go. It's what's intellectually responsible to have a real discussion in the Humanities Center. That's the truth. We Ask have to Steve. people's time too, Bruce. You, you, people can leave. leave. People can leave. I I don't get, I, there's a very good response to what Steve says, but you're not going to hear it. You're gonna cut fine. Write a paper and give it at the next round back. Say what? Goodbye, Bruce. <clears throat>